Thank you all for being here. I want to say a special greeting to all those of you sitting outside in the dark. <laughs> welcome. On both sides, welcome to you. Standing and sitting, my goodness. Now, some of you can't see me. I understand that. But don't worry, you couldn't see me all those years on radio either, so... <laughs> Just c close your eyes and... It'll be pretty much the same. You know, I had a lady come to me after a service some years ago, and I had not met her before, and she uh, came up afterwards, and she shook my hand, and she said, oh, it's so good to put a voice and a face together. <laughs> then she said, you have a great voice. I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> Let me just encourage you to pass by the bookstalls out here, and don't just pass by them. Pick up some good Christian resources for yourself and for your family. Uh, there are some of my books out there, I noticed, and um, if you would like to add value to that book, you get a pen and your book, and you bring it to me, and I will sign the book for you. I'll autograph it for you. Uh, you know, and the reason I do that is it's a proven fact that books autographed by the author are worth about 25% more on eBay. So <laughs> feel free to bring it to me. You know, you're also special to me. Linda and I have loved over these years coming to Jamaica multiple times. This is our third Keswick, Kingston Keswick Convention. It's always good uh, as a part of Back to the Bible to meet our faith partners and our prayer partners. Sister McCoy, I don't know that there could be any greater greeting that I got tonight, though. Thank you so very much. Just delightful. We were in Sri Lanka one time preaching at a university chapel. Now, there were a lot of uh, folks there. We were just using the university chapel, and I was asked to go to the back after I finished preaching to greet the people at the door as they exited, and so Linda and I did, and I was standing closest to the audience, and she was next to me on my right. And no sooner was the amen said then I saw a woman about halfway up the audience in a very, very beautiful white sari. She must have been six feet tall. She was a, just a very, very striking woman. And she broke from the audience, and she, on a full charge, was running back to the back of the church. And I kind of sized this up, and I said, yep, she's coming right for me. <laughs> and when she got there, the last two or three feet, she was airborne. <laughs> and I kind of caught myself and her, and she kept saying in my ear, my Savior, my Savior. And I kept saying, Jesus is your Savior. <laughs> Jesus is your Savior. I finally got her off of me and over to Linda to uh, <laughs> greet her. And all I could hear was Linda saying, Jesus is your savior. <laughs> <laughs> I love the greetings that we've had over the years so much. None of them more exciting though than here in Jamaica, thank you. This is Wednesday night of our week-long Kingston Keswick Convention. We began on Sunday night, we will conclude next Sunday night. And every night I'm just amazed at how many hands go up for those who are here for the very first time. Now, if this is your first time, I need to tell you, however, <laughs> that if you could only come one night during this conference, this would not be the night to come. Tomorrow night's message will be much better than tonight's. But since you're here, please stay 
but come back tomorrow night. We have been focusing every night this week on the theme of this year's Kingston Keswick Convention, and that is the church image or impact. So we started by looking at what the first century church was like. On Sunday night, we took uh, six different snapshots. Maybe it was seven. I've forgotten now. I don't have film in my camera anymore, so I can't count them. But we took snapshots of the church, and we saw what made that church so effective, why they had such a tremendous impact. They turned the world upside down. Then on Monday night, we continued by thinking about what was the image of that first century church in the Roman Empire? What was their image and what was their impact? Last night, we spent our time in Acts and sometime in Hebrews chapter 5 because this first century church actually had a way to chart spiritual growth among their believers. Now, this is not a test. This is not uh, something that you take on your own. This is just Ephesians 5 says, look, if you're spiritually immature, this is going to be what you look like. But if you're spiritually mature, this is going to be what you look like. And we noticed all of those last night. And I told you last night that tonight we were going to focus on implementing the third third. Now, what I'd like to do, because of the wonderful honor that you've bestowed upon me tonight and upon Linda, I'd like you all to take out your watch and get a good look at it. <laughs> take out your cell phone, look at that. If you love Jesus, turn it off. <laughs> we will be out of here tonight no later than midnight, so cheer up. <laughs> In 1968, there was a book written by the name Every Man His Way. The book was written, edited actually, by a man by the name of Alan Dundas. Professor Dundas uh, writes an essay in that book entitled, The Number Three in American Culture. But when you read that chapter, you know he's not just talking about American culture, he's talking about human culture the impact that the number three has had on the cultures throughout the world. The number three has a strong impact here in Jamaica. The number three has a strong impact in China. The number three has a strong impact all over the world. And if you don't believe me, let me remind you of some things you know that come in threes. There was, of course, Athos, Porthos and Aramis, the three musketeers. <laughs> there was Jose Carreras, Placido Domingo, and Luciano Pavarotti, the three tenors. There was Melchior, Caspar, and Balthazar, the three wise men. Maybe that's a little uh, stronger than you want to go, so let me say something that you'll really recognize. There was Curly, Larry, and Mo, <laughs> the Three Stooges, yes. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, three old Greeks. Tom Watson, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs, three old geeks. <laughs> when you go to the college or university, you can graduate laude, magna cum laude, or summa cum laude. Or as I did, thank the Lord. <laughs> there is a sequence of commands that they give when soldiers are ready to fire their weapons. They are ready, aim, fire. And one nobody knows better than Jamaicans, just before Usain Bolt leaves those blocks, there is a gun that is fired, and preceding that firing, there is on your mark, get set, go. See, we're, we're impacted by threes. Our whole society around the world, we just have this natural gravitation to threes. Hegel, the German philosopher, had his thesis 
antithesis and synthesis. When you go to the court, it used to be you always said that you must tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. See, you're getting it. Here's a trilogy that you mothers will especially appreciate. There are three ways you can get your children to do something. Number one, you can do it yourself. <laughs> number two, you can hire someone to do it. Or number three, you can ask your kids not to do it. <laughs> Threes. Well, the Bible is filled with many trilogies like that, many threes. The gifts of the Magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Israel's three patriarchs were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Christianity, we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Noah had three sons who repopulated the earth after the great deluge. Job had three friends, miserable comforters, all of them. King Saul and his three sons were killed on the same day. David had his three mighty men who went and got a drink for him from the well at Bethlehem. Solomon's temple had three distinct compartments to it, the outer court, the Holy of Holies, and the Holy Place. Solomon's temple, three distinct places, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. By the way, how many Hebrew children were there in the fiery furnace? Three. Very good. Shadrach, Meshach. Yeah, I knew you'd say Abednego. Look it up. It's Abednego. Not Abednego. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times, yes. It's pretty easy to see the threes in the Bible. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus died on the middle of three crosses. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, so now abide hope and faith and love these things. Three, but the greatest of these is love. There is a set of threes in the Bible, however, that we don't often recognize. Oh, we know they're there. We just sometimes get two out of three and forget the third third. Now you understand why I've titled our study tonight, Implementing the Third Third. Let me um, help you to understand how we implement the third third by reading some words from Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, you know that as the what? The Great Commission. And you all agree with that, right? That's what Jesus said? Yeah, I, I really suckered you there. I set you up for failure. I apologize. Because I cut out a third of the Great Commission, and you didn't even miss it. Let me read it again. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, it's that third third that somehow in the church of the 21st century is the stepchild of the Great Commission. We're very anxious to fulfill the Great Commission. The first third, making disciples, that's evangelism. 
The second third, baptizing disciples, that's incorporating them into the life of the church. The third third is teaching those disciples so those who are one to the Lord through evangelism and incorporated into the life of the church can actually pursue spiritual maturity every day of their lives. What I want to talk with you tonight about is making sure we don't forget the third third. Teaching is so important because if we bring a person into the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and they get their foot inside the door of salvation and 10 years later that's where they are in their spiritual growth, we are not guilty of neglect, we are guilty of spiritual child abuse. The third third is so important to us today and it was so important to the church of the first century. Time and time again, you will find in the church of the first century those references to teaching one another, teaching them daily in the temple, teaching, teaching, teaching. And yet today, quite often, the pastor's message on Sunday morning, perhaps the Bible study on Thursday night, we get two good hours of teaching a week, and we think we're pursuing spiritual maturity. You wouldn't think of eating twice a week, would you, and letting it go after that? So I want to encourage you tonight. If you're a pastor here, if you're a lay leader here, you're an elder here, you're a Bible teacher here, you lead a Bible study, if you're a mom or a dad here, a grandma or a grandpa, you have a wonderful opportunity to teach those who know they need to be taught and they need a teacher. And God has ordained you and me to be that teacher. Well, evangelism today is uh, quite often reduced to the numbers game. You know that. It's often true that when a report goes back to a donor or to a board, an evangelist will tell how many hands were raised or how many decision cards were signed or how many people viewed the DVD or the film or how many stations the program aired on, how many Bibles we distributed, and all of those are good things. But somehow we've gotten hooked on numbers instead of seeing evangelism as the entry point to a lifetime of growth in Christ. Now that's what Keswick has been about all these years, moving down the road to spiritual maturity, not stopping with evangelism. And baptism, the same way, often becoming one with Christ today is an event-oriented thing instead of a daily walk with the Lord. You know, in churches we have our events. Uh, Sunday school sometimes has been substituted with an event once a month or a men's event or a ladies' event. We're, we're so event-oriented today. Events are great. I speak at a lot of events around the world. But I've got to tell you, friends, you cannot build to spiritual maturity in your life by going to this event and that event. First of all, there aren't enough of them. Secondly, if there were, you wouldn't go anyway. And you need spiritual growth every day of your life, not every event that comes along. Frustrated people have turned to more successful pastors to be their pastor. Pastors have turned to more successful pastors. Rather than go to the Word of God to find out why this church of the first, first century had such an impact on the first century, they go to the current successful pastor, the one whose church is the largest, who has written books on church growth. They think that if God did it that way there, God will do it that way here. But the people of Antioch didn't believe that. What God in, it did in Jerusalem, he didn't do in Antioch, and vice versa. That's why the Spirit of God is ready and willing to make your church just what he wants it to be. Evangelism, necessary. Baptism, necessary. Teaching, absolutely necessary. 
teaching today is often relegated to parachurch organizations, professionals, weekend events, videos, DVDs, things like that. In the earliest churches, Antioch and Jerusalem, once you were saved and once you were baptized, teaching always followed in that trifecta process of leading you to spiritual maturity. They never forgot to implement the third third. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Those who accepted the message, that's evangelism, were baptized, that's incorporating them into the church, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. See, there are three threes in the Great Commission, not two threes in the Great Commission. And if you're not convinced that teaching was such an important part in the movement of God and the kingdom of God in the first century, think back prior to that. Teaching was the method that Moses used in leading the people of Israel. You know, when Moses' father-in-law was giving him advice about leadership, this is what Jethro said to Moses. He said, you shall warn them, the Jews. By the way, the word warn in Hebrew there is the word for teach. You will teach them, the Jews, about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. You will teach them and make them know. Exodus 18, verse 20. It was Moses' style of leadership to lead by teaching his people. When Moses instructed Aaron and his sons on their responsibility as priests, he said, you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. That's Leviticus 10, verse 11. The first responsibility of Aaron and his priesthood was to teach the people the law of God. Teaching was very important to Moses. Teaching was also the method of the Old Testament priests. Listen to this, 2 Chronicles 15, verses 3 and 4. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord and sought him, he was found by them. What happened to the Old Testament Israelites? They wandered away from God, the true God, and they were not listening to a teaching priest. They did not get their daily dose of the law of God taught to them so that they could be obedient people to God. Ezra set in his heart to study the law of God. It says, Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, and to do it and to teach his statutes and the rules in Israel. He was going to study, he was going to do it, practice it, and then he was going to teach others how to do it. Teaching was important to the Old Testament priests. Teaching was important to the Old Testament prophets. Prophet Isaiah asks some pertinent questions in Isaiah 28, verse 9 and 10. He says, to whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are wearied from the milk, those taken by the breast? For it is precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That doesn't sound like an event weekend to me. Precept upon precept, line upon line. The question is, who is going to teach them knowledge and explain the message to them? I'll tell you who. A teacher. You. If God has called you to be in a position where you can teach a younger believer, you have the greatest and grandest opportunity in the world to help them move down the road to spiritual maturity. By the way, since we're talking about Old Testament prophets, what about Micah? Uh, prophet Micah dreams of the day when all Israel will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us 
his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah 4 verse 2. The Lord will teach us his ways. But you see, a teacher needs a student. A teacher needs willing ears and an open heart, a mind ready to receive the truth, and often Israel was not. Sadly, often the church of the 21st century is not. Now again, I'm speaking in generalities, and you understand that I don't mean every church has in its congregation people with deaf ears. Well, okay, they probably do, but, <laughs> but that may be the exception rather than the rule in your church. And if it is, thank God for your church. But in the Christian religion, the faith of our fathers in this century, one of the things this church needs more than anything else is the teaching of the Word of God. Amen. Teaching, my friends, was the method of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, 23 says of Jesus, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Teaching and preaching. Teaching and proclaiming. That's how Jesus got the job done. Matthew 9, verse 35, repeats exactly the same thing. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And then there's Mark, chapter 6, verse 34. Jesus saw, listen to this, don't miss this. Jesus saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Now, I'm not extrapolating truth here. I'm not making up truth here. I just read what Mark chapter 6, verse 34 says. Jesus saw a crowd that was hungry. Jesus saw a crowd that had lost its way. Jesus saw a very needy crowd, a great crowd. He had compassion on that crowd. And because Jesus had compassion on the crowd, what did he do for them? He did not feed them. He did not clothe them. He taught them. Now listen, that does not exclude feeding them and clothing them. But the initial response Jesus had to a crowd of which he had compassion was, they need to know more of the Word, and I will teach them. If you're a Sunday school teacher or a Bible study leader, don't ever think your responsibility is immaterial to the church. It is essential to the church. Jesus' method was teaching. Teaching was also the method of these earliest churches. We've seen that over and over again these past four nights. When the church of Jerusalem began to grow, the priests and the Sadducees rounded up the disciples and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Don't do it. Whatever you do, don't speak. And heaven forbid that you would teach in his name. What a powerful, powerful injunction to these disciples. And you know, of course, what they did. They went right out and taught in the name of Jesus. Later, the high priest questioned Peter and the apostles, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. The very first thing they did when they got out of prison was teach the word of God. Teaching was also the method of the apostle Paul. In fact, he was one of the greatest teachers ever walked the face of this earth. Acts 15, verse 35, Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Why were they there in Antioch? To teach the word. Paul was a teacher from the very moment he came to Christ as Savior. In fact, so much so that everybody was afraid of Paul. 
They didn't realize the change that had come in his life on that road to Damascus. Paul speaks to the Colossian believers. In them, he says, in Christ you will have the hope of glory. And then he says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now, I want you to mark this verse down and put it on the sticky side of your mind, friends. Colossians 1.28 the purpose of the Apostle Paul was to teach the word so that everyone who heard him, he could present to the Lord Jesus mature in Christ. Not half-baked, half-taught, or just with one foot inside the salvation door. He wanted them to go all the way to become like their Savior. Mature in Christ. Later, Paul advises these same Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And the final verse of the book of Acts that we've been spending each night in will continue throughout Sunday night. The very last verse of Acts, which was read tonight, says that Paul lived in Rome two whole years at his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul, you're in prison. Well, it's not like most prisons. You're under house arrest. You must stay within that house. There is a guard there to make sure that you do stay within the house. So when you do have visitors, when they come, what will you talk about? Well, I'll complain about my situation here because, you know, the bread is stale and the, the bed is not at all comfortable. But I'm suffering for Jesus. Paul didn't do that. He saw an opportunity to teach about Jesus. And every time the man drew a breath, what came out was someone being taught about the Lord Jesus. He lifted Jesus higher and higher and higher every time he spoke. That's teaching. And that is the third third of the Great Commission. Well, the piece de resistance of the third third is Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the three parts of the Great Commission. The last part, one third of the entire commission, is teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. You know, a, a mediocre teacher tells. A good teacher explains. A superior teacher demonstrates a great teacher inspires. Don't you love those teachers that you can remember from your childhood who inspired you? That's the kind of teacher we need to be to others. That's the kind of teacher every Bible study leader needs to be. That's the kind of teacher every mom needs to be to her children and every dad to his children. A teacher who inspires them to want to know more of the Word of God, to be more familiar with the Lord Jesus. One who will not just simply pass over what God says, but one who will immerse himself in what God says. Well, let me bring this to a close. I've said tonight that what the church of the 21st century needs is one of the keys to the success of the church of the first century. And that is, they were given to teaching people the word of God. Once they were saved, once they were born from above, they were next incorporated into the life of the church for fellowship and for teaching. If we fail to teach those who come to know Christ as Savior, if we allow them to stay right where they were when they got inside that door of salvation, they are ripe for cultists to come in and steal them. Absolutely ripe. I've been burdened for a long time for the church of the Lord Jesus around the world and for pastors 
who are laboring among God's people without any training at all. Pastors who don't know anything about the Christian faith. Pastors who know very little about the Bible. Now, they're fully well-intentioned. They love the Lord. They love their people. They just have had no opportunity for training. One of the things I think God has impressed upon me to do in my retirement is to take what God has given me over 50 years and try to share it with these pastors. Maybe tomorrow night I'll take a few minutes and tell you more about that, which is why you need to come back <laughs> tomorrow night. Here are some of the truths I want to round out our evening with. Truths that are regarded by many as self-evident. You know, that's the problem. You get to the point where you say, is it necessary we teach people? Oh, yes, it's self-evident that we do. And because it's so self-evident, we aren't going to do it. Listen to this. Here is a truth that is self-evident but needs to bore its way deep into your mind and into your heart. Number one, God only wrote one book. I think he'd be pleased to have us read it. This is that book right here. You can read slowly and meaningfully this entire book in 72 hours. 26 books of the Bible can be read in less than 15 minutes. Half of the books of the Bible can be read in less than 30 minutes. Five books of the Bible have only 25 verses. When we stand before the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ and he asks us, did you read my book? I wonder what we'll say. Uh, Lord, uh, I only lived to be 95. If I'd lived just a little longer, I could have gotten through it. Look, Father, I, I tried. I started Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. went pretty well. I got over to chapter 11. There were a lot of names there. I got to Leviticus and, oh, man. Then I got to Chronicles and more names. So I decided, let's skip all that and go right to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1 wasn't any better. What do you suppose will be an acceptable excuse should the Lord ask you at the judgment seat of Christ? Did you read my book? Somehow I don't think there'll be much of an excuse acceptable. Now you say, how do you know the book, the Bible, can be read in less than 72 hours? I wrote a book some years ago entitled, Read Your Bible One Book at a Time. Now the principle here was, you sit down and you read through an entire book in one sitting. Paul, what he wrote to the Philippians, for example. There are four chapters. Paul didn't intend for the Philippians to read chapter 1 today, chapter 2 tomorrow, chapter 3 on the weekend. It's a letter. You sit down and you read the whole letter. You don't read page 1 of a letter and set the rest aside, do you? So the principle here was you'll get more out of that book if you sit down and read the whole way through it. Now, Philippians, that's not bad. Ezekiel is a little more difficult. And I had to know how long it would take to read through every book of the Bible to put it inside this book. So everywhere I went for some months, I took my Bible with me and I took a stopwatch around my neck, just hanging there. And as I would fly, I'd get my Bible out and start to read and I'd click my stopwatch and if I got interrupted, I'd click it and respond to the flight attendant or whomever and when I started again, I'd click it, and at the end of every book, I wrote down how long it took me to read that book. In fact, I was flying back from Frankfurt, Germany one time to Chicago. I, I won't tell you the airline I was on, but uh, all these people are united in the way they do uh, things. And uh, 
I, I had had some, you, you can tell my personality is such that I, I banter with everybody. And I had bantered a bit with a flight attendant and she came back the aisle later and she saw the stopwatcher on my neck and she stopped dead in the aisle next to me and she said, are you timing our service? <laughs> I said, no, I'd need a calendar for that. No, no. Uh, I said, no. And she said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm timing myself to see how long it takes to read my Bible. And she looked at me pretty much the way you're looking at me right now. <laughs> Why would you do that? Here's what I said. Everybody tells me they read their Bible, but they don't have time. I want to find out how much time it takes. It doesn't take very much time, friends. So, principle number one, God only wrote one book. I think he'd be pleased to have you read it. And when you do, you will be teaching yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, the will, the way, and the word of God. Secondly, God wants us to fellowship in a body. He wants us to be a part of a church. He wants us there to corporately grow in the word, grow in worship, grow in preparation for the battle against Satan. And yet, in a lot of churches, attendance has waned over the last number of years. Oh, the one big service, everybody comes. Just try to get them out to do something else. Principle number three, Jesus is the only way to God. And those who do not trust him to be their savior will die in their sins and spend eternity without him in hell. And yet we are so silent when it comes to telling friends, family, neighbors about the love of God. And principle number four, moving down the road towards spiritual maturity is God's plan for every follower of Jesus Christ. Not just the elite who become pastors or the elite who become your Bible study leaders. God wants you to mature in Christ so you can be presented to him fully mature in the fullness that is the Savior. That's God's plan for you. And if you and I fail to meet that plan, we are disobedient to God. Now, you see what can happen when a church becomes more interested in its impact than it is in its image? When we become more interested in what happens through the church rather than how the world views our church, we too can turn the world upside down. We have the same God, we have the same gospel, we have the same power of the Spirit, what would prohibit us from seeing the kind of revival that they saw in the first century? No one but us. No one but us. I want to read something to you as I close. Eva Hart was seven years old when her father woke her in the middle of the night carried her outside in a blanket and told her, hold mommy's hand and be a good girl. It was the last thing he ever said to her. She never saw her father again. Later that night, wide awake and clinging to her mother in a lifeboat, the little girl watched as the Titanic plunged to the bottom of the sea, carrying her father and more than 1,500 other passengers and crew members to their deaths in the North Atlantic. Survivor Eva Hart remembers that night, April 15, 1912, just under 102 years ago. She says, I saw all the horror of its sinking, and I heard, even more dreadful, the cries of drowning people. I could remember the colors, the sounds, everything, Eva said. The worst things I remember 
were the screams. But even worse, she conceded, was the silence that followed. Eva remembers, and I quote her, it seemed as if once everybody had gone, drowned, finished, the whole world was standing still. There was nothing, just the deathly, terrible silence in that dark night. Think about that picture. Because one day without the Lord Jesus Christ, the whole world will stand in silence in the death of that dark night when they reap what they have sown their entire life and it'll be finished. Now, you know how you can best help the world? Be the best you you can be. And you will never be the best Christian you you can be if you stay right inside the door and fail to move down the road to spiritual maturity. I beg you, in your own life, in your church, in your Bible study group, with your children, with your grandchildren, implement the third third. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, Life is difficult enough as it is. But to think about the responsibility of being a teacher, for some people, admittedly, that is a horrendous, horrendous challenge. They don't see themselves as qualified. They don't see themselves as gifted. They don't see themselves as, well, brave enough to teach others. But Lord, help us to remember that a great deal of teaching is taking your truth and telling our story as it relates to your truth. So Lord, give us to the frequent, daily, consistent, meaningful study of your word so that as Paul said to Timothy, the things that you have heard from me, commit to faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. Lord, blazon in our hearts and on our minds tonight the absolute necessity of the third, third of the Great Commission. Accept our thanks, Father, for the good work you do in our lives. In Jesus' name. We thank God's servant for another inspiring word. The importance of teaching for Teaching always leads to spiritual maturity. We're going to sing a closing hymn, which is a prayer. It is the hymn, and maybe those that are at the controls in the multimedia room, this is the hymn, may find this hum, hymn. It's teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. We'll give them some time to... Uh, find this hymn and then we will sing oh it is there good may we all stand make it your prayer we're going to end this uh, service not with an altar call but with your expressing your desire to God for him to teach you notice the words of the song teach me thy way O oh Lord, it is asking him to be your teacher. 
Shall we sing? Tea.